back into the soundboard. Boston piano designs grow out of the Steinway designs. They grow out of what we learned by studying the piano expertise that Steinway developed. I've seen the Bostons evolve, and uh, this is the best work they've created. What sets Bostons apart from other pianos is the fact that they really sing when you play them, and they give you the sound that you want. No matter what genre you're playing, no matter what level, how long you've been playing, they will help you sound better and the best that you can be. The Essex Piano was designed by Steinway & Sons to ensure that beautiful piano styles and finishes are possible in every price range. An Essex Piano is a surprisingly affordable option for those with a desire to own a high-quality piano and to join the Steinway family. By employing the unique patents and expertise that have made the name Steinway synonymous with musical excellence, Essex pianos achieve a level of quality and performance that is far superior to any other instrument in their price range. There are a number of key features that set the Essex apart from other pianos in terms of quality and value. The single most important component of any piano is the soundboard because it projects the beautiful tone produced by the instrument to the musician and all who listen. It is the heart and soul of the piano. Each Essex soundboard is crafted of premium grade, straight grained spruce for proven superior tone quality. Essex soundboards are also perfectly tapered, which allows them to vibrate more freely. The result is a powerful, sustained tone. In comparison to other grand pianos of the same length, the Essex Grand Piano offers a larger soundboard due to its innovative wide tail design. This larger soundboard means a richer sound. The action of an Essex Piano is designed by Steinway and made up of all wood parts, never plastic. The result is proven durability as well as heightened responsiveness and control. By providing the musician with a greater level of responsiveness, tone, and playability, the Essex Piano allows advanced players to fully express themselves musically and is a perfect teaching piano, allowing those less advanced to discover and develop their true potential. Steinway designed a grand piano bracing system and upright back assembly to provide a solid, stable platform for the soundboard. Radial bracing on the grands and massive staggered back posts on the uprights creates a solid foundation for the strength and stability of the piano and the beauty of the Essex tone. The pin block of an Essex piano is made of hard maple and layered multi-directionally to grip pins from several directions. This ensures a tight fit and uniform pressure on the tuning pins. Hundreds of cut threads on each pin grip the pin block to keep the piano in tune for longer. Some other key features of the Essex piano that benefit from Steinway designs include a plate made of gray iron that is over-engineered to provide strength to support the enormous string tension. Hammers made with premium grade felt and metal ligatures to deliver optimum performance. Bridges of vertically layered maple for better transmission of sound from the strings to the soundboard and tension and duplex scaling that ensure a longer sustaining tone and added harmonic dimension. A major benefit of buying a piano that is a member of the family of Steinway Design Pianos is the Steinway Promise. This promise states that if you decide to trade in your Essex piano for a new Steinway & Sons Grand Piano at any time, within 10 years, you will receive a trade-in credit equal to the original purchase price. If you've ever dreamed of owning a piano designed by Steinway & Sons, you owe it to yourself to experience the Steinway-designed Essex Piano. The Essex, available in a wide selection of finishes, sizes and styles, delivers a level of playing experience and value previously unattainable, enabling Steinway to meet its goal of offering a range of pianos that satisfies virtually every need, skill level and budget. We invite you to learn more about the family of Steinway Design Pianos and to experience the Essex Piano for yourself.
To find the Steinway dealer for your area, visit Steinway.com. My name is Matthew Maimoni, and I am a Steinway teaching artist living and performing here in New York City. I've got a show off-Broadway, and it's been quite a ride. I practiced very, very, very many hours on Boston pianos, and they allowed me to build my technique and build my musicianship in a way that other pianos couldn't. I'm Susan Kanegi, and I'm an engineer for Steinway Piano. It's not one principle that makes the Boston sound the way it is. It's that we, Steinway, designed the Boston pianos. Like Steinway and Boston both use quarter sawn Sitka spruce for our soundboards. I like the fact that the tone is sophisticated without being aggressive. Uh, it reminds me of the sound that we make at Steinway. The tone of the Boston pianos is incredibly rich and has a lot of color. There are many, many gradations. And it's that low tension scale. You get this magnificent Steinway family tone. I tune the piano. I see it's got a feature in the pin block called an octagrip structure. 
and it's very similar to what we have in the Steinways. Uh, and I can feel it because uh, the control of the tuning is easy. Which means it'll be a better quality tuning and it will last longer for the pianist. As a Steinway teaching artist, I recommend Boston's to all of my students. The response time and action on these Boston pianos is incredible. Because they're made well and because they have the same essential action geometry as the Steinway action. The inner rim is made of hard rock maple. Hard rock maple is absolutely the best rim material because it doesn't absorb the vibrations of the soundboard. Rather, it reflects them back into the soundboard. Boston piano designs grow out of the Steinway designs. They grow out of what we learned by studying the piano expertise that Steinway developed. I've seen the Bostons evolve, and uh, this is the best work they've created. What sets Boston's apart from other pianos is the fact that they really sing when you play them, and they give you the sound that you want. No matter what genre you're playing, no matter what level, how long you've been playing, they will help you sound better and the best that you can be. The Essex Piano was designed by Steinway & Sons to ensure that beautiful piano styles and finishes are possible in every price range. An Essex Piano is a surprisingly affordable option for those with a desire to own a high-quality piano and to join the Steinway family. By employing the unique patents and expertise that have made the name Steinway synonymous with musical excellence, Essex Pianos achieve a level of quality and performance that is far superior to any other instrument in their price range. There are a number of key features that set the Essex apart from other pianos in terms of quality and value. The single most important component of any piano is the soundboard because it projects the beautiful tone produced by the instrument to the musician and all who listen. It is the heart and soul of the piano. Each Essex soundboard is crafted of premium grade, straight grained spruce for proven superior tone quality. Essex soundboards are also perfectly tapered, which allows them to vibrate more freely. The result is a powerful, sustained tone. In comparison to other grand pianos of the same length, the Essex Grand Piano offers a larger soundboard due to its innovative wide-tail design. This larger soundboard means a richer sound. The action of an Essex Piano is designed by Steinway and made up of all wood parts, never plastic. The result is proven durability as well as heightened responsiveness and control. By providing the musician with a greater level of responsiveness, tone, and playability, the Essex Piano allows advanced players to fully express themselves musically and is a perfect teaching piano, allowing those less advanced to discover and develop their true potential. Steinway designed a grand piano bracing system and upright back assembly to provide a solid, stable platform for the soundboard. Radial bracing on the grands and massive staggered back posts on the uprights creates a solid foundation for the strength and stability of the piano and the beauty of the Essex tone. The pin block of an Essex piano is made of hard maple and layered multi-directionally to grip pins from several directions. This ensures a tight fit and uniform pressure on the tuning pins. Hundreds of cut threads on each pin grip the pin block to keep the piano in tune for longer. Some other key features Hi, everyone. Good evening to all our Asian friends. Good morning or good good afternoon to our Western and European friends. On behalf of House of Piano, Steinway, Indonesia, I would like to greet every one of you. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, as today, 
we are going to start about today's webinar on the art of touch and piano technique by Chong Yi Wong from Singapore. Today is the second collaboration with FIFO Music. I am truly honored to be the moderator in this incredible event. Thanks for inter in, in the invitation and the trust from HOP Steinway in, and Sun Indonesia, uh, Mr. Leo, the founder, and thanks uh, for the teamwork with the whole team of HOP, Mr. Dickey, Mr. Rizky, and Ms. Karen. Thank you very much, Ms. Yeni. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. I would like to thank each of you for joining us today. I hope every one of you will enjoy and get the most benefits of today's webinar. I would like to introduce you the manager of House of Piano, Mr. Dickey. Please join us in giving him a big applause for the opening speech. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Ms. Jenny. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Okay. 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 Hi. Good evening, everyone. And a very warm welcome to all the participants of Stanway Enrichment Session this July. The Art of Touch and Piano Technique. Presented to you by House of Piano and Stanway and Sons Indonesia. Supported by Boston and Essex Piano. Okay. A very special welcome to, to Mr. Chong Yi Wang, who is now joining us all the way from France. And also Mrs. Jenny Sumono as our moderator for the second time. Thank you for your support and kindly be a part of our standby enrichment session. Thank you. We are, <laughs> we are very pleased to have so many participants this evening including piano students, piano teachers, music teachers, parents, music lover, and also participants from the foreign country, such as I see uh, from Singapore, Malaysia, maybe Australia, and other countries. Best greeting from House of Piano. <laughs> OK. Stanway Enrichment Session is the one of the House of Piano event, which has been created and dedicated to enrich the knowledge of the participant. We are very determined to be a part of supporting and developing the skills of pianists and teachers, and also the progress of classical music in Indonesia. This is why House of Piano is not just providing the best musical instrument, but we also provide an inspiring and educational event. We hope that what you are doing to learn so many valuable knowledge tonight, which will be useful to escalate your skill in piano touch and techniques. Stay healthy and always keep a positive mind and spirit. Thank you once again. And we hope that you will enjoy tonight's Stanway Enrichment Session. Okay, I will pass to Mrs. Jenny for the continuity of this event. Yeah. Please, Ms. Jenny, thank, thank you. you thank <laughs> uh, I would like to extend a special thanks to our presenter tonight, uh, Mr. Chong Yu Wong, a French-based Singaporean concert pianist. Chong Yu has enjoyed phenomenal success in numerous international piano competitions. Today, he will share his remarkable knowledge and bring us deeper and also foster us, every one of us, to become a better student, better teacher, and even better musician. Okay. Let's join me in welcoming Chong Yi Wong with a huge applause. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for, for your invitation and uh, very happy to be here. Um, the last time I came to Jakarta was in 2000 and 2015, 2016. 
And uh, I played in House of Piano, so I had very good memories of, of House of Piano. Just not so much good memories of Traffic Jam. <laughs> 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 Bad traffic in Indonesia. But uh, we are very happy to be joining today. And I hope uh, that those of you who are following me today will, will get to learn a lot. So now I will be sharing with you uh, the presentation that I, I, I worked on the entire week. Okay. There we are. Okay. So those of you who have followed me for the last session, I actually spoke about the same topic, but today I will go more in depth. Uh, I will show a few examples of uh, exercises that I do uh, from time to time and uh, important exercises for you to understand touch, um, different techniques of touch of the piano. So uh, once again, thank you for inviting me. I'm very honored to be here. And um, I hope that um, whatever I'm about to share, uh, although it's very personal, I hope that it will help you in your pianistic journey. Okay, so let's get going. Um, just a quick reminder, this presentation will take about uh, an hour and you can always ask me or Jenny if you want to have uh, a version of, a PDF version of this presentation. Uh, in case you have any questions, we have a question and answer at the end of this session as well. So look forward to your questions. So the course of content, we will be speaking about technique, of course, uh, the tradition of the bridge. Uh, those of you who have heard me in other webinars, I'm always speaking about the bridge because that's, that's essentially the most important part of piano playing. That's, that's the, the hand and the, the strength of your hand, and that's the bridge. Uh, then we'll be listening and uh, reacting to sound. Uh, of course, with Zoom, uh, we are quite limited to sound, but I'll try to explain the best I can. And then I'll be speaking about some examples and I'll be sharing a few stories as well. And then uh, towards the end, I will be demonstrating exercises. Okay, so uh, what is technique? Um, technique is, uh, I found this on online, a way to do something that needs scales or thought. So playing the piano uh, requires both because if you don't think and you have no scales, uh, you have no technique. <laughs> so anyway, um, just uh, something to chew on. Uh, then today we will be uh, speaking in different parts. We will be in three different parts and there is the introduction, which is what I'm doing now. And there will be a, a second part where I will be um, showing some examples of uh, a great pianist, Steinway artist, and uh, showing a few pieces that you can be practicing while, while I'm explaining, um, because all of you are mute, right? I imagine if you're in front of your piano, you can try what I'm doing. And uh, in the third part, I will be going in depth uh, of how to do finger exercises, hand exercises, and, and so on. Okay. So um, this is the introduction and the end of the introduction is, uh, I think Steinway has um, an advertisement for us. So we'll be watching something by Steinway. Okay, uh, stay with us. We are coming soon. Okay, uh, we are seeing some advertisement on uh, at TV. Okay, stop. My name is Matthew Maimoni, and I am a Steinway teaching artist living and performing here in New York City. I've got a show off-Broadway, and it's been quite a ride. I practiced very, very, very many hours on Boston pianos, and they allowed me to build my technique and build my musicianship in a way that other pianos couldn't. I'm Susan Kanegi, and I'm an engineer for Steinway Piano. 
It's not one principle that makes the Boston sound the way it is. It's that we, Steinway, designed the Boston pianos. Like Steinway and Boston both use quarter sawn Sitka spruce for our soundboards. I like the fact that the tone is sophisticated without being aggressive. Uh, it reminds me of the sound that we make at Steinway. The tone of the Boston pianos is incredibly rich and has a lot of color. There are many, many gradations. And it's that low tension scale. You get this magnificent Steinway family tone. I tune the piano. I see it's got a feature in the pin block called an octagrip structure. And it's very similar to what we have in the Steinways. Uh, and I can feel it because uh, the control of the tuning is easy. Which means it'll be a better quality tuning and it will last longer for the pianist. As a Steinway teaching artist, I recommend Boston's to all of my students. The response time and action on these Boston pianos is incredible. Because they're made well and because they have the same essential action geometry as the Steinway action. The inner rim is made of hard rock maple. Hard rock maple is absolutely the best rim material because it doesn't absorb the vibrations of the soundboard. Rather, it reflects them back into the soundboard. Boston piano designs grow out of the Steinway designs. They grow out of what we learned by studying the piano expertise that Steinway developed. I've seen the Bostons evolve, and uh, this is the best work they've created. What sets Bostons apart from other pianos is the fact that they really sing when you play them, and they give you the sound that you want. No matter what genre you're playing, no matter what level, how long you've been playing, they will help you sound better and the best that you can be. Okay, so we are ready for the next presentation. We continue uh, the second one, and let's see the highlight. Uh, John Yu also uh, is playing with the Boston piano. Okay, John Yu. Okay, so uh, continuing on to my next part uh, of the presentation, I'll be speaking about space and um, how to react to space. And actually, um, it's very important that the pianists try to understand this because nowadays, you know, it's all about who is playing faster and who is playing louder. In every competition we hear pianists, you know, technique, impeccable technique. And it just, the goal is just to play without any, any wrong notes, you know. But it's very important that before and after you play the note, there are two ways to react to the sound. And actually that's, that's the anticipating of the sound before you strike the key. And after playing the keys, you hear the sound. So all this takes time. And it's very important that every pianist actually realizes this because then we are always told to practice slow, right? The slow practice helps us to listen before and after. And then while we listen to the notes, uh, we hear phrases. So that's, that's the second part of listening to a sound. There can be few notes in the same phrase and there can be short notes, but going long distances. And this is another confusion because when, when you play a fast note, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a staccato. You know, it can be a, a very quick attack and the sound can go like, if you imagine you're in a, a, a salon, like in a, a uh, very echoey place. If you play a note, you will get a lot of echo, a lot of reverb, right? So then if you play with the pedal, it destroys the sound. It's like, you know, the, the uh, Rachmaninoff piano concerto. In the beginning, you have this, this beautiful chord. when the orchestra comes in. And all you hear is just noise because the, the, the orchestra is playing louder than the piano. So, you know, we have to adapt to, to the situation. If there are a lot of notes and you're just going to put one pedal, 
just look for the important notes. Don't, don't play every single note. You know, I have a student who plays this. Uh, we are just working on this today, and he played. <laughs> And I was I was just saying to him, you know, don't don't waste your time because with uh, with the orchestra playing, sixty musicians playing every instrument, you're not going to hear every note. You're just going to hear probably the bass. <laughs> and then you know, you just work on the important notes, and that's what I mean by taking time to listen to the notes that are being played. Because what you play, it's not just what your finger is playing, it's what your mind is hearing, what your, your brain is reacting to in space. Okay, so moving on, I actually prepared a, a diagram. Um, so uh, there are three different intersections of more like four. And um, you can ask yourself before um, I go more into details, what kind of pianist are you? Are you more of like a piano teacher, a, a performer, or a, like, you know, a, a competition machine? Uh, so anyway, I, di I did a diagram and it says that with these three different um, points, technique, and musical understanding and sound, how you can achieve to become the complete musician. Uh, if you're in intersection A, you have technique and you have uh, musical understanding and good ideas, but you don't have sound. Uh, you're, you're not really a stage person and you're afraid to, to perform in front of a lot of people. You're more of like a piano teacher. So that's what I put in intersection A. Intersection B, you have a uh, good technique and you have wonderful sound but you have no musical understanding. So you only think about playing fast and go to the end of the piece and next piece and next piece and next piece. You're a competition machine. So you should be doing competitions. You probably you get a lot of prizes, but uh, in the long term, uh, you have to go to learn more in depth uh, musical uh, phrases, uh, harmonies and, and all these kind of ideas by, I don't know, going, going to school, going back to conservatory maybe. And intersection C is if you um, have a good thinking, uh, you have a good sound and you have good musical thinking, and but you don't have technique. And that's maybe why you try to go for webinars like what I'm doing now. And uh, yeah, you are the music lover and nothing wrong with that. You know, you can improve at every level and um, intersection D is uh, the complete musician. You have everything and uh, it's rare, but there are, I know a few people who are really music genius when I was in school, they, they had absolutely everything, but that's, that's a big problem because when you have everything, then you stop practicing. And that's not what the piano is about. You know, um, playing the piano takes, takes years to, to I think it takes a lifetime to, to master. And so, okay, moving on to the next slide. Uh, I'll be speaking also about Andre Schiff. Uh, in 2018, when I invited uh, Dang Tai San to my festival, uh, you know, Dang Tai San, who was the Chopin winner in 1980, one of my piano idols, uh, piano heroes. He, I asked him who was his favorite pianist and he just told me, you know, just look at Andre Schiff. Look at how he 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 holds his hand. Look at how he he talks, and even when he's not playing the piano, you can see if you go on YouTube and you watch like his his uh, interviews, uh, you can see the way he holds his hand when he's just explaining about things. You can see his hand; he's holding like some kind of a bridge, and it's it's really very uh, obvious if you just look close. Um, yeah, I, I started looking at Andre Schiff in 2018. Uh, before that, I knew he did Prelude and Fuchs by, by Bach, but uh, I wasn't really interested. And I, I mean, after looking at Andre Schiff, I have to say it's, it's really one of the best examples uh, you can find out there for, for finger technique and how to hold your hands. Okay, so uh, if you look at 
Martha Argerich, Rubinstein, and Glengo. These, these are, for me, wonderful examples of uh, pianists who actually have fantastic technique. And technique, not in the sense, um, not in the sense where you, you actually think you play loud or fast. Technique in the sense where you know that they are, they are big, great pianists because they are confident of what they are playing and they know their, their capacity. You know, that's what technique is about. It's like clothes. You don't want to wear clothes that don't fit. You know, you don't want to play fingerings that, that are too difficult because you have small hands. Or if you have big hands, you don't want to be doing fingerings with small hands. So it's, it's really, everyone is different. And it's, it's really important to understand if you're a piano teacher that if your student cannot do something, it's not necessarily your fault. It's everyone is different, you know? And for me, um, I, try, I try to do like, you know, finger technique with my kids, but um, sometimes I, I'm, a, I'm a bit stuck because what I want, they cannot do, you know? So it, it takes time to, to understand and it takes time to adapt. So uh, speaking about the Steinway, this, these three artists on this slide, they are uh, Steinway artists as well. And it's great because Steinway through the century, you know, through, through the time, they, they continue to, to provide with so fantastic instruments. And without these instruments, I don't think there will, there will ever be any great pianist. It's just, it's impossible. And uh, today I, I will be showing some, demonstrating some um, exercises on Boston, but I have to say that I have a Steinway in the other room, a Steinway D, and that was the best thing that happened to me since I became a pianist. It was the, 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 the best uh, investment I did, I think, since I became professional. So I think uh, Steinway would like to share um, another advert with us since I'm speaking about Steinway artists. Okay, so for the next uh, advertisement on the TV ad, uh, we are going uh, to be back soon. So stay with us, hang on, we'll be right back. The Essex Piano was designed by Steinway & Sons to ensure that beautiful piano styles and finishes are possible in every price range. An Essex Piano is a surprisingly affordable option for those with a desire to own a high-quality piano and to join the Steinway family. By employing the unique patents and expertise that have made the name Steinway synonymous with musical excellence, Essex pianos achieve a level of quality and performance that is far superior to any other instrument in their price range. There are a number of key features that set the Essex apart from other pianos in terms of quality and value. The single most important component of any piano is the soundboard because it projects the beautiful tone produced by the instrument to the musician and all who listen. It is the heart and soul of the piano. Each Essex soundboard is crafted of premium grade, straight grained spruce for proven superior tone quality. Essex soundboards are also perfectly tapered, which allows them to vibrate more freely. The result is a powerful, sustained tone. In comparison to other grand pianos of the same length, the Essex Grand Piano offers a larger soundboard due to its innovative wide tail design. This larger soundboard means a richer sound. The action of an Essex Piano is designed by Steinway and made up of all wood parts, never plastic. The result is proven durability as well as heightened responsiveness and control. By providing the musician with a greater level of responsiveness, tone and playability, the Essex Piano allows advanced players to fully express themselves musically and is a perfect teaching piano, allowing those less advanced to discover and develop their true potential. Steinway designed a grand piano bracing system and upright back assembly to provide a solid, stable platform for the soundboard. 
Radial bracing on the grands and massive staggered back posts on the uprights creates a solid foundation for the strength and stability of the piano and the beauty of the Essex tone. The pin block of an Essex piano is made of hard maple and layered multi-directionally to grip pins from several directions. This ensures a tight fit and uniform pressure on the tuning pins. Hundreds of cut threads on each pin grip the pin block to keep the piano in tune for longer. Some other key features of the Essex piano that benefit from Steinway designs include a plate made of grey iron that is over-engineered to provide strength to support the enormous string tension. Hammers made with premium grade felt and metal ligatures to deliver optimum performance. Bridges of vertically layered maple for better transmission of sound from the strings to the soundboard. And tension and duplex scaling that ensure a longer sustaining tone and added harmonic dimension. A major benefit of buying a piano that is a member of the family of Steinway Design Pianos is the Steinway Promise. This promise states that if you decide to trade in your Essex piano for a new Steinway & Sons Grand Piano at any time, within 10 years, you will receive a trade-in credit equal to the original purchase price. If you've ever dreamed of owning a piano designed by Steinway & Sons, you owe it to yourself to experience the Steinway-designed Essex piano. The Essex, available in a wide selection of finishes, sizes and styles delivers a level of playing experience and value previously unattainable, enabling Steinway to meet its goal of offering a range of pianos that satisfies virtually every need, skill level, and budget. We invite you to learn more about the family of Steinway Design Pianos and to experience the Essex piano for yourself. To find the Steinway dealer for your area, visit steinway.com. Okay, so let's continue to the next presentation by Chong Yi Wong. Okay, Chong Yi. Okay, so back to the bridge. Um, this is the, a tradition that um, my teacher always emphasized on. And those of you who have been to my past webinars will have already heard about the bridge. And um, so, you know, um, the bridge came from Anton Rubinstein, um, one of the great pianists of the last century. Not, not Arthur Rubinstein, it's uh, Anton Rubinstein. Yeah. So uh, she had an assistant, Mary Perez de Brambera, who uh, taught at the Conservatory of Marseille in France. And uh, she was uh, the teacher of my teacher's teacher. So. Uh, if you look at the, the last slides before, uh, it was Marcel Campy. And uh, Marcel Campy was also related to Franz Lies because I think his mother or was a widow or something, well, had something to do with Franz Lies. So he was like, you know, to go to for technique and everyone in France wanted to learn with Marcel Campy, like the godfather of piano. And so, um, here he describes in an interview, my teacher um, spoke about his, um, his relation with Campi and how Campi got to know about the bridge. Uh, through Marie Perez de Brambilla, who was an assistant teacher in the Conservatory of Marseille. And uh, Campi played with the hand very open. Uh, it's not really very open. Uh, it means that you play with your hands very, um, very stable. Yeah, with the knuckles up, and later I will show you when when I finish with the slides, I will show you in the next uh, in some videos of exercises of how you can work on the bridge, and uh, the forearms relaxed and the whole being controlled in space by the arm, the muscle of the arm as a whole, and no attack uh, designed from the elbow or the the wrist, and even Vladimir Pulemuter, who was a student of Ravel. Uh, he shared the same principles, and I worked with him in London for three weeks at the Mandarin School. Uh, and he played for for Vlado Pulemutia, the third skater of Chopin. And he spoke the same language and the same phrasing. 
So I think you can go to many different schools. You know, you go to Germany or Russia or England. You know, actually, music is quite universal. You don't really have like um, oh the German way or the French way. It's really quite quite international. You know, and even if you go to the states, most of the teachers are from Europe. So it's it's very universal. I don't believe in in the French school or the German school. Or the Russian school. Now, if you can play music, uh, it's it's your expression and it's your way to play uh, your music. Okay, so like I said, I'm going to be speaking in different uh, aspects for technique. There will be weight, and then uh, there will be speed, and there's going to be depth. And for for starters, I will begin with weight. So to fully understand weight, uh, you have to be um, you have to be conscious of or conscious of your body, of how you are positioned on the piano, because if you have bad posture, uh, you cannot produce a sound that is uh, open. Your sound will be blocked, and and you will be producing half sounds if you are playing with the arch back. I'm not saying that it's wrong, but uh, it can certainly meet the sound of what you can produce. And it's, you know, if you look at the past uh, pianists like Chopin, Litz, uh, Litz, Schumann, uh, all these pianists were um, very skinny people. They were not like huge, right? Because I, I think uh, practicing the piano, actually it's, it's quite a tiring thing. It's very, um, it's very sportive and um, it requires a lot of strength from the back. And if your back is not strong, uh, you can start to experience pain after long hours of practicing. You know, you see some pianists who are very famous at a very young age and they stop playing after 10 years because they practice too much and too early, you know, too much in, in a short span of time and they get injuries. Like, uh, like Lang Lang, he got, he got a problem with his, his arm because he, he over-practiced uh, the Ravel's piano concerto. So it, it really depends. Uh, on the piece that you're working on, but I don't, I don't uh, advise practicing more than three hours a day if you're doing one shot, because then your body has to rest. And so weight uh, comes mostly from uh, your back, uh, which supports your arm. And then your arms will be uh, very loose. Yeah, because if you have stiff arm, then you're not using the full, the full possibility of of the sound. To get sound, you have to have uh, loose arms and loose wrists, yeah? So here I wrote uh, Brahms 51 exercises. Uh, I will show you the score, but I will play for you later, yeah? Because uh, I don't know how this works with Zoom. I cannot have three screens on the same screen. So I will show you the score. It's uh, number 16. And I don't know how many, how many of you here have actually played this, but it's very, very uh, useful for, um, for high level pianists, because I think today's uh, Vermida was for more advanced students. Yeah, we're not speaking about beginners anymore. Uh, you have to hold the fourth finger on two notes, and then you play the notes uh, around your fourth finger. And I will show you uh, again, later when um, I, will, I will show you the exercises at the end. Okay, so um, then to understand weight, you also have to know that weight comes uh, mostly vertically because uh, if you play horizontal, you will be playing more speed. And if you're playing vertical, you'll be playing more weight. And if you mix these two up, uh, that's where you, know, you start playing with accents. And that's not good because uh, that's where the, the injuries come when you try to play too vertical. And then at the same time, uh, harmonies uh, that produce uh, playing chords, big sound, you know, when you're making with weight, you have to also listen, like what I mentioned in the last slide with space, because weight has everything to do with space. And think about distance. If you play in a stadium, you want to make the sound uh, go far. You know, you want to play for 500 people, for 1,000 people. 
you have to think about the last person on the in the hall, at the very, very back of the hall. And at the same time, uh, if you think too much and then you'll be banging, right? So you just have to think about distance. Don't think about playing loud, think about playing far. Okay, and the last point is uh, for inner voicings. I, I think most of you here play Bach, Prelude and Fugues. Uh, if you have good understanding of weight, you will be able to play the Fugues, no problem. Uh, you will be able to play inner voicings uh, easy. Okay, so now I, I will be sharing a short story. Uh, time is moving very fast. Um, so this is a story from Polini, uh, the winner of the Chopin competition. Uh, so you can see it says, uh, that boy plays better than any of us jurors. And this was said by Arthur Rubinstein when he was judging the, the competition in, uh, in, in Poland. And um, so the story is, is that uh, Polini, he didn't go on to do like a, a international career right after the competition. He actually went back to school and actually finished up his, his school before becoming a concert pianist, which I think deserves a lot of respect for anyone who wins uh, any competition, uh, choosing knowledge uh, above uh, fame. That's uh, so important for, for today's pianists, yeah. So anyway, she gave me a piece of advice, the best I've ever had in all those years. He asked me to come together with another pianist, Michael Bloch. Uh, Michael Bloch, I think he got uh, some special prize in the Chopin competition. You can't find his name in the competition, but uh, I think he got uh, the 11th prize. And Rubinstein really liked this pianist, but he never got any prize in, in Chopin competition. So they both went on the stage to get some prize and it went like a flash. Uh, here he recounts that Rubinstein just put his third finger onto his shoulder and then, you know, Polini couldn't even move because it was so, it was so, so heavy. And then Rubinstein said, by using this kind of way, I never get tired playing. And, you know, it's this kind of Im impressive way that we have to actually learn to be able to practice for hours to get this rich tone and loud, loud sound, you know, when you're playing a, on a, a big piano. And you see, sometimes the pianist is so small, but the sound is so big because the, the transfer of, of energy if you understand how your body works, you get the right sound. But if you're playing and you're not feeling comfortable, you know, you're using fingerings that are too difficult for your level, that's, that's where you have to be very careful. So then he says that uh, Rubinstein managed to tra transfer his, through his third finger, all the strength of his arm and shoulder in a natural way, right? The, the, the important word here is natural, because if you can, find the most natural way, that's, that's the strongest way. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. Speed. So, uh, speed is uh, completely different from weight. Yeah, because then we are always um, confused when we say play faster. Uh, okay, you can think about playing faster now. You up the tempo, but most of the time, uh, most students, they play louder when you say play faster because it's a, it's a sports thing. You know, if you want to run faster, you have to put more strength and you want to go faster. But here you have to think to get speed. You have to think like a, a fat person runs slower than a skinny person because the, the weight is less and the effort taken is less. So if you want to go fast, you have to play light and very light fingers will allow you to play with no problem, okay? And then for um, finger speed, you have to do exercises. And in the last slide, I'll be showing you all the exercises that you will have to do to understand, fully understand all these aspects of uh, technique. Uh, you need to be able to understand finger strength and you need to be able to hear the, 
the nodes between the nodes, uh, the time that, that is being taken in between each node. So instead of playing a legato, like very, very legato, uh, you have to play almost semi-detached, like almost staccato, but with the speed, uh, it hides the these little spaces in between your nodes. So then there will be also exercises for upward movement. This I will show you in the, the next slide. In some examples with speed, you can try to play pieces like uh, Schubert Impromptu. This, this kind of pieces are very good for speed because uh, it's not loud and you can actually work on your fingers. Okay, and then depth. Um, in French, we call this profondeur. It's it's very important for playing French music because uh, most of this depth come from your arm. And if um, let's say you you have problems playing light, uh, you will not be able to produce certain effects in French music like water sound or like um, you know with a control of the forearm, making sideway movements, uh, doing glissandos, uh, this kind of thing will be quite quite difficult. So um, we'll get back to depth. Now let me show you all the different exercises. Uh, okay, so just gonna take a moment before, I think we can stop showing the slides. And then now we can see for the arm exercises, I do um, in three different movements. So we started with the back, right? So if you have a, a good sitting position, you should feel like if you drop your arms next to your body, you should feel that your arms are pulling you downwards. If you're slouching, then you cannot really feel that. Yeah. So you have to find a, a position that's natural. And so for the arm exercises, the three different movements are the elevator movement, which I do up and down, the vertical sound. And then you have the ironing board, which is the left and right. And then you have the drawer movement. So you pull. Maybe it helps if I do on my left hand. Uh, so three movements, the first one is here. The second one is here. And the third one is here. Okay, so um, it may sound really easy, but if you're doing um, with two hands, two different movements, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult, yeah? If you try to do it like this, one hand, and the other hand at the same time this, uh, it changes everything. So, you know, when you hear sometimes um, some pianists, they play very well, but they don't hear themselves. Like, uh, for example, just take any music you want and maybe left hand less uh, legato than the right. So you can, you can feel that the right hand is more legato. So you're making more this kind of movement and the left hand more up and down. Just an example, yeah? And then drama, it's when you try to make big chords. You pull, you pull your hands sometimes towards yourself. To have this kind of sound, and even in octaves, you know. So when you pull, the sound goes further than when you play in. And if you play out, yeah, you have different attacks, and this is why you have to work on the different movements and understand what is the, the most comfortable for you. 
So then the second part is the wrist exercises. There was the Brahms that I was going to show you. You keep your four fingers placed onto the two notes. And then you play the note in between. Okay, I'm not sure if you can actually hear clearly what I'm showing, but uh, you have to keep your fingers applied onto the two notes, right? And then you have to play with the wrist going in the inward movement down and up like this while playing all the other notes. And then if you have too much time, you can transpose. Okay, and then if you play on the black keys, it will be more difficult to do the movement. So you can do the minimum of movement. Just to get the movement right, you can just place this two, two fingers here and then start making the movement without playing the note. Uh, if you're in front of your piano, you can try it. It's, uh, it helps a lot with the uh, phrasing after, you know, when you make big phrases. The left hand is a little bit vertical and the right hand is horizontal. So this is already where you can feel the difference in movement. You're doing like different movements. Okay, and then we have hand exercises. So from the arm, from the back and the arm, we move onto the wrist and then now the hands. So for hand exercises, of course, there are, there are millions of exercises, but I've chosen uh, three different exercises, which are, I think, very important for for pianists, uh, especially young pianists. Um, I have these two exercises. The first one is called a explosive arpeggio. So I play any arpeggio. And when I play the last note of the arpeggio, I will close my hand. And then I will push and I will relax. So then again, so you play as fast as you can when you get to the last key, when you attack the key, you play it as fast as you can. So that's why it's called explosive arpeggio. Okay, and then uh, the second one is uh, coordinated staccato. Uh, so we can find different ways to do this, but uh, the most simple is to find the same notes, both hands, C to G, and uh, coordinated. So you do right hand staccato and left hand legato. And then you have to combine a little bit of the arm here. So you do staccato, you raise your arm to the height of your nose on one side and on the other side, you play legato. And when you get down, you change sides. Okay, it may seem extremely easy, but if you're doing it with me now, I think you would have seen how difficult this is. So if you can play it faster. So it always has a different movement. If you're playing vertical on the right, you don't move the left. If you're playing vertical on the left, you play the notes very close on your right. Okay, so these are coordinated staccatos. And once you get used to coordinating your hands, 
you can do coordinated. This is the third one, coordinated dynamics. So you play uh, louder on one side and softer on the other. So let's say you do 14 on the left hand. <laughs> on the right hand. Okay, this is a uh, simple exercises that I do with my students and it's it's essential. It's the, well, I think it's, it's very important, but there are lots of other exercises we can do, but I've chosen these three for today. And now the most important ones are the finger exercises. And here I have, um, I've chosen four different exercises for finger exercises. Uh, and so if you if you think uh, I'm going too fast, you can uh, drop me a message after the webinar and I will send you the, the different exercises um, by PDF, yeah? Okay, so there's four different exercises. Um, the first one is an inverted Hannon. So, you know, everyone knows Hannon, right? Yeah, so then, you know, if you play, then you have a lot of problems with the neighbor because you do many hours and it's so loud. So I changed this way of practice and we do it now inverted. So I go from the top and I do the same fingerings on the left hand. Okay, and then uh, with these exercises, you can do rhythmic variations. So what I call rhythmic variations is you can count two by two or three by three, you know. And then you can even do like uh, some kind of South American one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three. You have so many different ways of practicing these exercises with rhythmic variations. This is a very good way to get your mind uh, going when you're doing exercises. Never repeat your exercises uh, two, three times in a row. If you just do the same, you're not practicing, you're just uh, playing. And sometimes you play with the, the bad posture and the bad position and you repeat the same. So always refresh, yeah? If you do it the first time, the second time maybe a bit faster. Or a little bit louder. Or softer. Yeah, you see, I did with just within 10 seconds, three different variations. So always challenge your mind to do something different, okay? And then uh, this is the first exercise, inverted Hannon. Uh, the second exercise, that I give for finger exercises, uh, finger substitution. So you can choose any key you want on the piano. Let's say you take C, and then you just substitute the finger. One, two, three, four, five, four, three, two, one. Two, three, four, five, four, three, two, one. And then you go faster and faster. Yeah, just, substituting uh, yeah and avoid playing other other keys it's not easy yeah okay this one and then uh the third exercise um uh, it's just for running notes you know everyone likes to run right so for running notes i give three to one and then same way you will run up one note every time. And so you go faster and faster. And three to one and then four, three, two, one. And every time you keep putting in more fingers, four. Yeah, 
a little faster. Yeah, so this is uh, just what I call the uh, antivirus. You know, pianists, sometimes we, we don't practice for a few days, then your fingers get lazy, right? So it's, it's really important that the, the fingers are, are always warmed up with this kind of uh, easy exercises. You can do it in one minute. And then you can do it one, two, three. And so if you see my hands, I'm using a little bit of release as well when I play, I do this movement. Maybe not so much when you come down. But when you go up. Okay, and if you, if you just play anything that is uh, uh, Chopin etude, you will realize that it all demands the same kind of movement. You see? Every, every, almost every Chopin etude. Yeah, it, most most of uh, the etudes by Chopin demands this kind of movement with the wrist and fingers as well. So um, running notes will help you. Moving on to my fourth exercise, which is the repeated notes exercise. Um, so basically, if you are able to play three to one on three different notes, you will be able to play three to one on the same note. So let's say if you're playing C, then you just keep repeating three to one. Okay, and then you can go faster. And then you can play a scale. And I do hand and exercises with the repeated notes as well. Okay, and then three to one, and the same as what we did in the previous exercise, if we put four fingers, instead of three to one, we do four, three, two, one. But on the same note, it will be the same technique. It's a little bit more difficult, yeah? And you can play. Yeah, and so basically this is what I, I do for finger exercises in everything the same for the left hand. Um, and then if you just want to have challenge, sometimes you can change the notes, you know? Sometimes I do. And this, this kind of things for, to get the dexterity of moving your arm at the same time and not, not missing the note. Okay, so these are my four exercises for, for finger technique. Um, of course, there are a lot of other exercises you can do, but if you have any questions regarding um, finger exercises or, or anything that has to do with exercises, you can uh, write me a text or I will, I will respond, yeah? So um, I think now we have come to the end of uh, my exercises uh, and I just want to add that um, you know it's it's very important that everything that I I taught today it's it's not necessarily um, the the right way or the only way to play piano because there are so many different ways to play um, the piano. So you know it's 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 more about how you can find the most comfortable way to do uh, a, a a wonderful sound. Yeah, and not about the speed or or the, 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 the power of the sound. I think someone just asked for me to do the arm movements again. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, the arm movements. Okay, I'll show it to you again. The arm movements, the three different arm movements are called elevator. You know, the lift, when you take the lift up and down, it's up and down with your arm. And you know, with the muscle, it's here, it's your back. It's this muscle over here that you need to use to play these movements. Yeah, and you just raise your arm like you need to ask a question. This is the first one. And then the second one is the sideway one. This is the ironing board. Okay, and the last one is the drawer. So then you can, uh, like I say, you know, do variations with your exercise. If you think this is too easy for you, you can do left hand uh, different from the right. You can hold something, you put something in your hand and you close your hand as hard as you can. And then, oh yes, someone just asked another question about height of the bench. Well, it depends on the pianist. If you if it's a child, then um, yeah, the height of the bench is extremely important. The 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 bow, the elbow should never be too low. Like if you look at the 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 height of the the keys, it should be around the same height. Yeah, if you're too low, you will be playing like like this. So you want it to always be comfortable. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think uh, Stangwei has a, another video for us, right? Uh, two more. At the end. At the end. At the end? Yes. OK. You can keep on uh, to the Q&A session. OK, so sure. we have some question here. Any exercise to the difference arm, OK? Uh, May I ask about Glenglot? His posture is mostly hunchback. His body is yeah, near the piano. Uh, ah. I think that Glenglot, everybody can agree that Glenglot was one of the, the most uh, special, special pianists, right? He was very special. And uh, I think he was like a wonderful musician. Um, but he had a very terrible posture and that was the cause of his death as well. I think he died because of his back. So um, I, I will not recommend to play with a hunchback, but I have seen pianists with hunchback have a, a big career. So uh, I'm not saying that it's not right, but you th I think that health in the long term, health is more important than music. Yeah, I think a uh, Glenwood character is so uh, eccentric. You know, yeah. and he's kind of paranoid. Like when he uh, shake hand with someone, she is she using gloves even in some time. Pick on. <laughs> okay, any other question? Uh, we have another question coming up. Uh, dear Mr. Xiong Yu Wong, do you have any suggestion of the finger exercises for practicing octaves for small hands? Um, I'm reading the questions at the same time. Well, there are good questions um, for practicing octaves. Um, I just do octaves and then I play scales with octaves. Right, and then Sometimes I do the same on the same note and I play with the wrist. Like I would do six different levels of the wrist and I will take the, the lowest and I will play six times until it gets to the top. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then you go faster and faster. Well, of course, if you have small hands, um, then uh, you have to find exercises that suit your hand. Because this, for me, it's quite easy because my, my hands are not, I, I don't have big hands, but my hands are enough for tense. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not huge. Okay. Okay, and so let's move on to the next question. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about the Flat finger and round finger. Round. 
the curved fingers, you mean? Yes, um, I, I think that the, the curved fingers are, are good um, for classical music and the flat fingers are good for romantic music. You know, it's you have to be able to understand what kind of finger for what kind of sound. Like you don't want to be playing um, uh, romantic music with curved fingers because it sounds like like Glenn Gold playing Debussy. Have you heard? It's it's horrendous. <laughs> but you know, you want to you want to stay in this in the right style. So let's say if you play uh, maybe. See, you want to keep the sound round. So if you play with the round finger, then it's like you. It's it's a, it's a different different kind of technique for different style. So there is no preference. You have to do both. Okay, and this one. Uh, do you have suggest any exercises for weak left hand? Um, for weak left hand, just just start with scales. Do do simple scales, and then do arpeggios. <clears throat> you know, I have I actually like maybe a few years ago discovered that my left hand was not not fantastic, and I also started to look for exercises. And actually, in the end, there is no really one exercise that can improve your technique. You, you just have to play pieces, and then learn where where the weakness of the left hand is and then from there you work your way with new pieces now i'm playing this um chopin concerto in two months i'll be playing in portugal and you know the end the, the ending of this of this concerto it, it's really difficult you have the left hand <laughs> And then the hands together. It, it's just a nightmare to practice this, you know, because you have to learn everything. And just by playing this piece, I feel that my left hand is it's a little bit better just because I'm playing this piece now. So there, there is not really one exercise that can improve your, your left hand, but just keep learning new pieces. You know, as, as you learn new pieces, the, the, the left hand will get better. Okay, then uh, another one is from Lulu. Uh, hi, Mr. Xiong Yu, I'm a dog beginner. I'm 45 mm -hmm. and I took lesson two years ago. Do you think yeah. which one is more important? Reading the notes correctly or playing many songs? Okay, it's a, it's a very good question. But if you know, it's, this one can take another webinar to explain. Because I have adult students and I know it's, it's not easy for, for adults because, you know, to learn the capacity is different from, from a child. And, it takes a lot of time to understand things, but there is not more important in reading or playing. They are as important. Both, both are important because if you cannot read, what, what do you want to play if you cannot read? But if you can play, uh, how are you going to write down what to learn if you can play, but you cannot read? So you, you need to have both. It's, it's very, very important to know both. And, you know, I explained to another student the other day um, about the difference between learning, learning your pieces, playing and reading. And actually it's, it's quite the same because um, I, I gave an analogy with this student, you know, I say, uh, it's like you, you open, you want to go to somewhere, you want to go to the beach, right? But 
you don't know how to go to the beach. So you have to use some kind of uh, Google map or some kind of you know application to go, right? So then you don't know how to read the map. So how, how do you go to the beach? You cannot go to the beach if you don't read the, the map. And if you don't know how to read the map, you cannot get to the beach, right? So it's the same thing. If you know how to read the map, then you don't have to read the map every time because you just have to go once to the beach and you know, ah, oh, okay, this is the beach. Now I know this is the beach. And the next time when you go back to the beach, you know the way to go to the beach. You don't use Google map again. You know what I mean? So the, the difference is this because some piano teachers, they want you to read well. Like, you know what I mean? Like play like this. But it, it, it's, <laughs> it's just crazy. You know, you cannot walk with your eyes closed. You have to look at the notes. You have to look at the keys when you're playing the piano, right? So then another analogy with the same student. If you, if you play like tennis, right? Do you look at the ball when you play tennis? Do you look at the ball or do you look at the tennis racket? If you, if you look at the tennis racket, you are not going to play tennis. You're going to play uh, racket. <laughs> if you want to play tennis, you have to look at the ball. And this is uh, the, the biggest confusion. Sometimes when I, I meet some famous pianists, you know, I ask them some, some funny questions like, what do you look at when you play the piano? Do you, do you look at the, the, the people in the hall? Do you, do you look at the, the hands? What, what do you look at when you play the piano? It's very interesting because the different pianists have, have different answers, you know? And um, I, I think personally that when you play the piano, we should be looking at the keys. Because if you look at the hands, it's like, okay, sometimes you look at the hands because to get the right movement, but you cannot follow the hand because if you make a wrong move, then you will stop, right? So the, the goal is to look at the keys. It's like playing tennis. So if you look at the ball, every single key on the piano, it's like a ball and you are playing the different balls, you know, to get the notes. So if you want to read and you want to play at the same time, uh, that's, that's a different, a different webinar. We have to do a different webinar and I have to prepare some sight reading, uh, you know, and it takes a long time. <laughs> okay, so next question. Hold on. Well, we have a lot of questions. Yeah. Okay, let me just answer uh, one by one, yeah? Okay. Uh, let's go from, uh, what happens if we use the same fingerings to play one, 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 two, 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 three, two, two. Okay, yeah, same fingers, you can. But you cannot go faster than that. This is the maximum speed. Because then, you know, if you go very fast with this this part of your arm, you can get tendonitis. Yeah, you know, if you want to play something very fast, I don't like. I just recently played um, this uh, Aborado de Gracia, so, and then you have this. Cannot play with the same finger. It's it doesn't repeat, or maybe the sound doesn't come. Um, in Gaspar de la Nuit, same thing. But here, because you have the pedal on, you can cheat a little bit. You know what I do? I play one, two, and three almost together and sometimes I move. But the, what I do is I play a little bit on top, a little bit in the middle and a little bit at the beginning of the key. So I have a little bit of every sound. It's to have like an effect. But imagine if you make the same finger. Yeah, it's, it's quite... Quite quite difficult. Yeah. yeah. So you can you can play one 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 one. 
you can play any fingering, but if you want to go fast, you have to find the, the fastest one. Okay, next question. What is the best? Hello, this one's the same. Could you explain about techniques in depth or the depth in French music? Hmm. Okay, uh, this one is also like a different webinar, but uh, you know, for French music, it's very much impressionism. So you have to think about um, color palettes. Um, you know, when you see like a painting, sometimes um, you see something like very clear, uh, uh, maybe something to do with the beach. And then you have uh, the sun, you have people uh, everywhere swimming. The picture is there, it's clear. But in the French music, it's like, you don't know that it's a beach, but you know there is water. And you see the sun, but the sun is brown. And you see that there is, um, it's strange, yeah? You have to think more like uh, as a whole than to think more about details, like note by note. And it's very important that if you can imagine the image that what you are seeing before playing the sound, you will try to make the sound as a whole. Like let's say if you want to play. Yeah, you see it's, what I, what I imagine is like a piece of paper, right? It, it's white, but then in French music, the paper is not white, it's blue. And then you have to, find different colors to put on blue, you know? So you have dark blue, light blue, yellow, green, orange, red, you have everything in your, on, on, the, on, the, on the picture in front of you, but you are trying to draw something like a face of a man, but you cannot see the eyes, the nose and the mouth. It's just all over the place. And this is the sound that you hear. It's very much picturistic, but then it's in your mind. So to fully explain the sound of French music, uh, it should not be done on Zoom because uh, I'm pretty sure that none of you actually heard like the pedal that I've been doing from the start. With Zoom, it's, it's quite difficult. But um, yeah, if you record yourself, uh, you can hear clearer the pedal, but what kind of sound you want to produce and one thing that I can I can give one advice for French music, if you want to play French music, you can put the pedal before playing the, the note. Because in, in most classical music, you play the notes first and then you put the pedal after. So like when I play Claire de Lune, maybe I always put pedal first and then... Because it gives this, this impression like, you know, it's not clear what you're doing. It's it's not like Beethoven, you know. Uh, something very very clean and very direct. French music is very indirect and it's very dreamy. Yeah. So uh, yeah, good good question anyway. Uh, how do I use them effectively for for pedaling? Um, so pedaling on the piano, it's, it's pretty much the same concept as pedaling in the car. You know, when you drive, uh, if you just uh, hit on the accelerator too fast, you will get an accident. So you actually have to look and control. You don't want to go too much, too fast. You just want to be able to control your, your speed. And on the piano, it's the same. If you want a loud sound, you put a lot of pedal. And if you want to make a decrescendo or diminuendo, you take the pedal slowly out, you know. Um, it's like the clutch, it's not the accelerator. You have to kind of balance the, the pedal. And every piano is different. You have to be able to adapt to the piano that you play. So let's say if I, I do on my Steinway uh, in the other room, um, the pedal, it's, it's much thinner. Whereas this Boston, I have like the pedal like this, so I can move like a lot. 
there is much more uh, difference in the pedaling. So you just have to find the point where the pedal stops. You know, you keep playing until the, the sound is not sustained. And there is where you can have the, the perfect sound of your pedal. You know, just around here. You hear it's like half pedal. Just keep the, the leg close to the, the half pedal and move around there. Okay, so next question. Uh, so what kind of exercise for left hand should we do for a piece like Beethoven, Pathetic Sonata, first movement on the fast passages? Uh, so that we won't feel tired when playing on the fast tempo. Okay, first of all, uh, you shouldn't be tired when you're playing fast tempo because if if you're playing fast tempo and you're tired, then uh, most probably uh, technically there is something wrong with the uh, with the motor skills. Okay, so try try to uh, for Beethoven anything that has scales in it. I think it works if you practice just scales. It should, it should get there, yeah, for Beethoven. Uh, so I would like to help this person. I don't know. Uh, maybe you can drop me a message after that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how many hours of time should be devoted to practicing the piano every day? How many years does it take to be able to play the piano as reliably as the Lang Lang piano? <laughs> uh, what is the most efficient way to strengthen our piano playing technique? Okay. Um, personally, I think that um, three hours is, is good. Three hours a day, it's, um, it's more than enough if you are fully concentrated and if you are focused in everything that you are doing. But if you play three hours and you are just playing, you're not practicing, it's not enough. So you have to find a balance. Um, sometimes, you know, uh, it's not only about time, it's about uh, motivation. You have time, but you don't feel like doing something and it, it's not working. So it, it's important to, to enjoy, yeah? Enjoy before thinking about uh, practicing like a machine. And then uh, how many years does it take to be able to play? This depends on the, the pianist. Like uh, if you are very talented, you, you will not need 10 years to play very well. I have a student, he started three years ago and he's doing competitions already. So um, it really depends on, on, on you. Yeah. And uh, like I said, the most efficient way to strengthen your skills is by understanding your, yourself, your body, how you, you react to things and take time to develop also the, the, the hearing, what you hear, how you react to what you hear. Yeah, so the, the best musician, I think it's not necessarily technically the best. The best musician is the one that when you hear, you are interested to, to know more about. Yeah, because I can, I can give an example, like if you go to, uh, Alfred Brando or Mitsuko Uchida's concert, they are very old musicians, like in their 70s, 80s. I think Brando is 90. So if you listen to them, it's not the same kind of concert as if you go to listen to a concert by Wang Yujia or by Lang Lang, you know, where everything is so theatrical, they just play fast, explosive. Sometimes music is about uh, like um, enjoying and just listening, taking time to, to appreciate things in life. And it doesn't have to take a, a lot of effort to, to appreciate something sometimes. Yeah. The simple things are sometimes the, the most beautiful things. Okay. Okay. Uh, I don't understand this one. The next one. Do you have any tips on doing glissando 
or octave pleasant too. Yeah, I actually, I worked on this. Uh, uh, this one. Uh, Paganini octave pleasant. Actually, it's, it's very simple. You, it comes from the, the fact that you remember when I was explaining about depth, uh, if, you, if you go too deep into the key, you will not be able to go sideways. So the vertical and the horizontal, you got to think less vertical and you know, don't go down, just stay here and then push, uh, stay on, on the tip of the keys and then go fast vertically or horizontally, sorry. And another thing with the glissando, when, when I come down, I, I do something like this with my hand. I put my fingers behind my thumb, uh, so it's more solid. It goes faster. Like this. Yeah, be careful not to go too deep because if it goes above the nails, you can get injured above here. Yeah. yeah? So I always stay quite high. And then same for the up, I don't go above here. I, I stick to the tip of the fingers and I just move sideways. Okay, this one. Glissando, can I have another webinar on French music? Okay, Jenny, you have to prepare another webinar on French music. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, okay, Bach articulation two part invention number eight using um, staccato or phrases. Uh, we, yeah, yeah, I think you can, but you know, it's, it's faster if you just use the fingers to do the staccato without the arm. Fantasia and C minor, some triplets and stuff that works. Yeah, I'm not sure if this is a question. I, I'm okay. I, I agree with this. Okay, so I think Jenny, this is a, this is it. We're we are okay. at the end of our webinar. Yeah, I'll let you conclude some points uh, that you have been talking about. Uh, one of it you mentioned about the we have to pay attention to have a slow practice to listen the note before we play and after we play, is it? Mm -hmm. right? And uh, the one that you mentioned a couple of times, like uh, horizontal movement, the vertical movement mm -hmm. and the draw movement. Yeah. Uh, I get the conclusion that our mind is very important, right? And uh, we have to interact our mind, our brain, our ear, our eyes, like uh, I heard about this uh, uh, quotation, uh, I think it's from Leon Fleisler, like we had need to have a seeing ear and listening eye. So we, our eyes mm -hmm. must check, right? Our eyes, when we play, our eyes must check the notes. Is that right? And our ear must see the notes. Is it what we are playing with the right uh, articulation with the right notes, with the right not only with the right notes and uh, with the right rhythm, but also as well as with the right tone, with the right mm -hmm. dynamic, and with other details. So mm -hmm. we have learned a lot, and I admire the exercises. You know, is <laughs> more complicated, right? Uh, and yeah. it's very very encouraging for us to acknowledge. Uh, this kind of thing so we learn a lot for today's webinar thank you so much for everything thank you thank you so much for being with us and sharing your knowledge it's very precious for us tonight uh, what we have learned and it will motivate every one of us to become a better musician better teacher better person better student as well okay so Definitely. yes uh, before we end this session, uh, we will have photo session later. So everybody get ready for our photo session. 
And join me in a big applause to thank Zhong Yi Wo. Okay, so everybody uh, unmute yourself and join me in giving a big applause, a huge one. Do you learn a lot? Raise your hand if you have learned something different today. Thank you so much for your hands. Okay, so join me in a big applause. <laughs> Oh, there are so many of you. Thank you so much, Xiong Yi. We have learned. And yeah. let's this uh the time that we have spent together today that we become a better one in everything, especially we learn to become a better teacher to inspire other students, our students Definitely. inspire others. Uh, for the sake of the mission education, we are the person we use our skill, our talent to bless the nations. So thank you so much, everyone. Uh, the thank photo session now. Uh, Mr. And anyway, I, I'm doing I'm doing another live video in uh, five in three minutes with uh, Hanley. So if you want to join me in my next live, you can join me on Instagram. Uh, you can find me easily on Instagram. So. I will okay. leave my, my username here. And if you're interested, you can join us. I'll be giving out some credits on Handy. So this is my Instagram username. And there you go. Okay, done. Okay, so okay, ready I... for the photo session? Uh, any, uh, Pak Diki, Mr. Okay. Diki, you want to say something? Yeah, as a representative of House of Piano and Stanway and Sons Indonesia, I want to say thank you very much for Mr. Chong Yi Wang and also Mrs. Dennis Tomo for your kind support for this event and all the participants. Yes, thank you very much. And also, I want to info <laughs> that Please follow our Instagram and subscribe, subscribe to our YouTube channel, House of Piano official channel. There will be many more exciting events to okay. come with the great pianists and you can watch again on our uh, House of Piano YouTube channel. Keep yeah. healthy. Okay. Good night and thank you. Yes, thank Bye -bye, you. Everyone. Great. Thank you to Steinway and Sons. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Pak Diki. Uh, and all the team for the help and a special thanks to uh, Pak Leo, Mr. Leo, and our presenter, Chong Yi Wong. Thank you so much, Chong Yi. Thank, thank you. you. Thank yeah. you for inviting thank me. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. See you all soon. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Thank all, you all participants. Uh, photo Bye -bye. session already, yeah, Pak Diki. Okay. Yang photo session, everything okay already, yeah? Okay. Okay. Okay, everybody. Bye-bye. See ya, bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.